So, section headers. We've already alluded to it a couple <coughs> times. We saw way back in which header, which data structure talked about the number of section headers. Not you, anybody else? Which structure told us the number of section headers? File header. File header, yes. All right. So, sections, the point is basically to group similar, you know, code or data, things that should have the same permissions in memory, things that should be contiguous in memory, group them into chunks and then let the OS loader load them up and give them the same permissions once they're mapped in memory. <coughs> so back when we, let's see, do I have a picture? No. Back when we had that linker picture where the linker is like merging everything together, the point is to make the linker ultimately come out with, you know, here's all of your code. It's executable but non-writable. Here's your read-only data, so the non-mutable global data, things like strings, right? When you put a hello world, it's going to take that string and you see at least it's non-mutable. So you're just going to slap that string into a dot R data section where it shouldn't be manipulated. But then you may have global variables where you know you want to be able to update the globals. And that'll go into a different section where it's read-write but not executable. Right? So the point is just to kind of organize things, have permissions and stuff like that. So these are common names that you'll see across um, different uh, operating systems across different binary formats. You know, it all goes back to you know, a long, long time ago when they were making the first compilers, they were making the first sections. So, you know, dot text section is where the actual code goes. And here I put in, at least I probably should change this a little bit, but on Windows, in the context of kernel, which is what I deal with most of the time, the dot text section will ultimately be code which should not be paged to disk. So the kernel modules will typically, they'll have one section where it's code that can be paged to disk. You can go ahead and let that get kicked out of memory if you run out of memory. But the .txt section is always marked as non-pageable. We'll see, we'll see flags on these sections later that say don't kick this stuff out of memory. It should always be staying in memory. So, but anyways, .txt is code. Dot .data, that's read-write data. It's going to be global data because you know that your normal variables are allocated on the stack. You just uh, you know, allocate them within the context of a function. They go away when the function goes away. But for your global data, that's going to get its own location in <coughs> memory. And so that'll be read-write data, dot .r data, or on Linux it'll be dot .ro data is your read-only data. And again, that's things like strings, which are globals. They're something that can be, you know, maybe reused multiple places, but, uh, but they're, they, you don't want time to be mutable. BSS is sort of an interesting name, and according to different people, it stands for different things. Block started by symbol or block stored segment. According to the CMU architecture book, from which I learned, it is block storage start. So, block storage start, I don't know that that necessarily tells me what it's doing. Again, like that text, it's something inherited from long ago. But BSS is kind of interesting because it's a special kind of global data. It's global data which is not initialized to anything. So you've got, you know, sometimes in your code you may say, you know, put something at the top of the file, global, you know, g, g, whatever, say g zero rules equals one. G zero rules equals one, therefore that's initialized global. That should have a value of one when this program gets started, right? But if I just put, you know, g loop, g zero rules at the top and I didn't put equals one, then it says somewhere in the code it's going to initialize what that value should be at start. And I don't have to like the, o, the, the OS itself does not need to ensure that there's a one there. The compiler itself does not need to ensure there's a one there. And therefore, you can have this type of global data that's not initialized. You don't need to waste file space on it, basically. Don't, you know, you may have 1,000 different global variables, but if none of them have a fixed set value, then you can just go ahead and say, all right, I'm going to need 1,000 global variables worth of space eventually when this program is run. But for right now, on disk, I don't need to allocate any space for it. That would just be wasted space. When the code runs, it'll you know, maybe take in a packet and set the global based on the first packet that it sees or something like that. So it doesn't need to be set on disk, wasting space. So BSS is going to be a section where it's going to have a zero file size on disk but it's going to have a non-zero file size in memory. So it's going to take up some memory, but it's not going to take up disk space. 
So that's notionally what a VSS is. In reality, it gets merged in with other sections. So what you'll see is like the .text section will be bigger in memory than it is on disk. And what that really meant is that the linker merged the VSS section with the text section, for instance. Actually, it's more commonly merged with the data section. So let's say the VSS and data got merged. You'll see when we get into these headers, <coughs> the file size is smaller than the memory size because it's saying, I want the OS to allocate space because there's going to be global variables at the end, but I don't need any particular value to start with those global variables. So that's notionally BSS. All right, I think I forgot to say the last class. IData and EData, these are again notional things that you won't actually typically see in your P format, uh, sorry, in your P files. They do exist, but they then get merged in with other sections. So IData is notionally where import information goes, where it keeps like the list of DLLs that it wants to import from. And EData is the information about here's the functions which I export that other people can call within my code. But so what you'll typically see is those just get merged in with you know, the, the dot data section. And you won't see them as their own section in section headers. But it's still uh, kind of important to, to know that notionally that sort of stuff is getting grouped up and moved around behind the scenes, even if ultimately it gets merged in with other sections. <clears throat> uh, page, so here, OK, I think this matters for a question later. Page star means that these section names in kernel modules will be like page verify or page lock. So it'll be P-A-G-E-L-C-K or something like that. So later on, when I ask you what prefix is used to indicate code which is allowed to be paged out to disk, the prefix per Microsoft's convention is page. They always name their pageable sections page. So later on, it's page, not page star. So if I ask you what prefix, page, not page star. Anyways, again, as I said, dot text section is the main. This is where the code goes. But in kernel modules in particular, they'll have page log, page verify, things like that. Most, uh, I think it's the most common one is just page. Just page is typically the code section that is allowed to be kicked out to disk when you run out of, uh, you run out of physical memory. All right, dot reloc is Relocation information, that's I told you before. If the thing's going to get moved around in memory, it needs to have all this data structure that says, uh, here's all the constants you need to update in my code. Dot reloc is the section which will typically hold that. And dot resource, the resources, you can kind of think it like it's, I kind of showed before in the notepad. I don't think I have notepad open anymore, but. Resources are things like, uh, pictures, you know, the icons for the file at different resolutions. You'll see with, um, if you take the rootkits class, you'll see with Gmer, it can embed an actual kernel module in its resource section, and it just pulls the kernel module out, dumps it to disk, loads it up so that the kernel module is running, and then communicates it with it. Process Explorer, if you're familiar with the Sys internals tools, actually, I guess those of you who took the uh, malware class, right? Process Explorer, it looks, you know, it's Process Explorer on exe, right? It's just a plain exe. In reality, it has a kernel driver that's embedded in its resource section. It reads that full PE file out, and then it dumps it to disk and loads the kernel driver. So resources can have everything and anything. Things like Stuxnet used it to carry around, like here's exploit one, here's exploit two, here's the DLL that I'm going to inject, and so forth. So Stuxnet carried around all of its you know, extra stuff in the resources section. So when you look through the... Uh, the Stuxnet dossier and all those things, you'll see they like list, okay, resource one, resource two, resource three. Here they have particular functions and they're analyzed and elsewhere. All right, so this is the location where all the sections are. There's an array of section headers immediately after the NT header. And again, the NT header has embedded in it file header, an optional header. So basically, right after the optional header information, you should find the section header. If you put even a single byte between those two, the OS loader is going to get confused. It always assumes that immediately after the optional header, you've got an array of data structures that look like this. Image section header. So there's about five things in here that we actually care about. 
So the pressure on C union, so you can see in this definition, there's a union here between physical address and virtual size in this MISC field. All right, so as a reminder, a union is not like a normal data structure where it's like you've got this value and then you've got this value. A union is two different names for the exact same data. So there's not two D words here. There's one D word, and you can either refer to it as misc.physical address or misc.virtual size. And we're always going to refer to it as misc.virtual size because I don't know that physical address is ever used anywhere. I'm pretty sure that's like something left over, or maybe it's something used on other architectures, but I've never seen the physical address used for anything on Windows. So we're always going to refer to the virtual size as either just virtual size or misc.virtual size. <coughs> so. Back to the things we care about. First one is name. So I just went over all those different names for sections, dot text, dot data, and so forth. That <coughs> is actually stored right here in the name field. Now name is actually just eight bytes. It's just eight bytes that are allocated, and you can put whatever you want in there. It doesn't have, you can have code section that's not named dot text. This name is just for the humans. It's not for the compiler. It's well, it's for the humans, and it's for you know, potentially the linker, but. Uh, the loader really doesn't care at all. So the OS loader doesn't care whether it's called .text or .xeno. This is mostly just so that the linker can merge stuff from the same sections, things with the same uh, characteristics. And then, what was I just going to say? I forgot. I don't know. And the main point is just the OS loader doesn't care what it's called at all. Important thing you need to know in case you ever find yourself having to parse a PE file for some reason is that this are typically ASCII characters. It doesn't necessarily have to be. And you should not assume that this is null terminated. So don't assume it's like dot text and a null. It could be dot text one, two, three, four, five. And then uh, the point is if you're expecting it to be a normal C string with a null terminator and you try to do a string copy or something like that, you're going to have a bad time. So, that's all I wanted to say about the name. Virtual address, all right, again, we've got something called virtual address, but in reality, it's a relative virtual address. So again, we're in the context of section header. So we've got some section, it's got some name, and now it's got some relative address where it wants to be mapped into memory, all right? And so again, this is relative to the base. So if you're looking at the data structures, you say, okay, the base says it's going to be located here. And the relative virtual address says it's going to be plus, you know, x1000. Now, I believe in this next round, I'm going to be asking you some questions to the effect of what's the RVA of this section. And then I may say, what's the virtual address of this section? And that's probably ambiguous. Then that's why I need to change it back to absolute virtual address. If I ask you, unless I say, like, what is the section header dot virtual address, then I'm asking you just give me the literal value. If I'm saying, like, where is this thing mapped into memory, or if I'm saying what the, I should be saying what the absolute virtual address, what I want you to do is add the base to the relative address. All right, so, uh, Bill, I want to go over to the board quick. So, we can think of this like there's going to be some file which gets mapped into memory. And when it gets mapped into memory, there's still going to be some headers in here somewhere. But the things we're caring about now is that there's going to be the dot text section right here, and there's going to be the dot data section right here. Right? And so in the header information, it may say that the RBA, which is that virtual address field, equals X1000. And so if I'm asking you where in memory this thing is mapped, if I ask you the RBA, it's just 1,000. If I ask you like the ABA, the absolute virtual address, I want you to take that offset. Plus, we're just going to assume the file gets mapped wherever the image base says. We'll assume it doesn't get relocated. So if the image base equals, you know, hex, let's say, 40,000, then if I ask you where is the dot text section mapped in the memory, you say, 40 or 41,000, right? X 41,000. So I just want you to sometimes do this plus that just as a heads up. I think I'm going to have to see. I'm hoping that it's clearer in the questions. Otherwise, I'm going to have to change back to saying the question is absolute virtual address. This is where it's ambiguous. All right. C 
So virtual address is the RVA of where the thing gets mapped into memory. There's going to be two things. I'm kind of covering them. You can go either way, but virtual address is where this section is mapped into memory. Pointer to raw data is where this section is in the file. Okay. So it's saying this is a relative offset from the beginning of the file. So you're saying pointer to raw data. If it's hex 400, it's saying you find the dot text section hex 400 into the file starting from the beginning. And so this is basically, as I was saying, there's two things. There's where does the section start and where does the section end. So these are the two where it starts. Starts in memory, starts on disk, and then on direction. And then the next thing is, where does it end? And so we don't have like just an end address, we have a size. So we have a start and a size. So misc.virtual size is where it ends in memory. So Bill, I'm going to need to go over to the board again. Virtual address says, where does it start in memory? Pointer to raw data says, where does it start on disk? Misc.virtual size is this total size right here. And size of raw data. Is this total size right here? And so this slide is starting to get into, there can be some interplay. So the size of raw data could be bigger than what's in memory, or what's in memory could be bigger than what's on disk. And I'll, I'll try to explain that briefly. And this is where we go back to talking about that, that file alignment, for instance. I think I have pictures for this. Yes. The question is, are the pictures any good? Looks like their formatting got a bit messed up. All right. Let me, let me try to walk you through this quick. Um, yeah, it says that sometimes one is larger than the other, and sometimes the opposite. Yes. Where would be a situation where the... That's exactly what I'll talk about next. I'll talk about one case for one, one case for the other. It explains it actually here, but I want to walk through this first, and then I'll explain why one would be bigger than the other. All right, so, well, I guess I'm just explaining what's on the previous slide. So I talked about the BSS section before. First, we're going to talk about, you know, why would the virtual size be greater than the size of raw data. So why would it take up more memory than it takes up space on disk? Well, I already told you about the BSS section, right? So BSS, you got some global variables. They don't have a starting value, so you don't need to bother with storing them on disk, right? So let's say that we've got the you know, dot data section and the dot BSS section have been merged. What we now have is that there's going to be some space on disk. So this section data, I put hex 200 right here. And that's from the size of raw data is equal to hex 200. But in the header information, it says the virtual size is 300. So that means when I'm on disk, I only expect to see size of raw data, which is hex 200. But when it gets mapped into memory, it's going to take that 200 bytes from disk, map it into memory, and then it's going to allocate an extra hex 100 bytes just because the header information said so. It says, look, I need hex 300 bytes. So it's going to take 200 from disk and then have an extra hex 100 of basically uninitialized, well, in this case, zero initialized data just because it doesn't want to leak memory and stuff like that. It leaks the values of the previous things. And so this is what you would see when you have a BSS section either by itself or attached to the end of some other section. Allocating extra space to filling global variables there later. And so why would the size of raw data actually be bigger than virtual size? This is the more interesting thing. And this has to do with the optional header file alignment. So I said before, back in the optional header section, there's file alignment. And I said it's the most common thing you're going to see is hex 200 there. And that's going to be because you know the size of the sector, for instance. And so with normal compiler-generated code, this is not going to have, just like the memory alignment, doesn't have to be the case. The file alignment doesn't have to be the case. But with 
regular compiler generated code, the compiler is going to say, okay, I default to hex 200 file alignment. I make a new section, and let's say you have a uh, let's say you have a dot data section where you allocated exactly one global variable. Right? You have one global variable, and your dot data section is going to be four bytes big in a 32-bit system. So the compiler uses a default file alignment of hex 200. So it makes a new section. It says, okay, the dot data section is four bytes big. Then it sees, okay, well, my file alignment says I need to use sizes of hex 200 big. So it'll do like this. Um, well, this is, we'll go to this instead. Let's say you allocated a dot data section that is, um, you know, hex 100 big. So you've got hex 100 of, of global variables. But hex 100 is less than 200. So therefore, the, the, the uh, compiler, the linker, is going to just pad this space out. And it's going to say, I, look, I always put section data in multiples of hex 200. So even if you have a tiny 4 byte thing, even if you have a 100 thing, it's got to be aligned based on hex 200. So on disk, it's going to pad this out so that the size of raw data is greater than the virtual size, but it's still kept track of that. Really, when you map it into memory, you only need hex 100 of that data because that's the only real data for you know, global variables. And we'll just map that into memory and leave the rest of that stuff sitting on disk. So these are the two cases. The most common thing is VSS. You've got some virtual memory that's not, not, not initialized, and so you're going to make space in memory. And the other case is you have a section that's not exactly x400 aligned, or sorry, x200 aligned, and therefore the normal compiler will just pad it out to whatever the file alignment is. Doesn't have to be the case. Malware can manipulate this. Malware can, you know, have a section that's only four bytes large, but a normal compiler will basically do this. Like I said, you know, heck, why is it hex200? It's because it's the size of a sector, so they can just go read exactly one sector off disk and you know, map it into memory if they want. All right. And, all right, last thing, characteristics, and then we will break for lunch, and you can come back early and play the game if you want to, to get a leg up for the competition, or you can uh, just come back on time. All right, characteristics, this is where, I mean, the most basic level, section characteristics are trying to ex enforce things like read, write, execute. All right, so at the very bottom, execute, read, and write. Just saying, I want this section to be marked as executable, but then your typical code sections, it'll be marked as read and execute, but non writable. Your typical data section, it'll be marked as read and write, but not executable. So the compiler by default will put those sort of permissions, but you know, typical exploit code will change the permissions and things like that. All right, then we've got other characteristics. So it can say whether or not it contains code and say whether or not it contains initialized or uninitialized data. But uh, things we care about are things like discardable. So discardable is an interesting one. So the relocation section will typically be marked as discardable. So we said relocations are used when you've got something that moves in memory, like a DLL moves, has to move in memory, and then you've got to fix up all the constants that are embedded in the code. Well, the OS has to fix all those constants, but then it doesn't need this data anymore. It fixed them all, the code can run. It should be able to just throw that away and never touch it ever again. So the relocation section will be marked as discardable so that the OS knows, all right, after all, the OS loader does all of this stuff, it can reclaim that memory and not waste it by keeping that stuff mapped into memory. So it's basically just an, an efficiency thing. If a section is not needed while the thing is actually running, you can just go ahead and throw it away after load time. Same sort of things with uh, cached and page. Page, as I said before, used most commonly in the kernel, where you say, like, look, this kernel code really always needs to be mapped into memory, because if someone tries to execute it and it's not there, you just crash. But this code over here, maybe this is optional. Maybe I can you know, bring this in on demand if necessary. And so I can go ahead and mark that as page, or I can not set the not paged flag and then the OS will potentially throw it away if there's not enough physical memory. So you'll typically see the .text section marked with the not paged flag. All right, so that is pretty much it. I guess I just showed some examples in Visual Studio where you know, right from within, if you want, you can rename sections. Like So here, I can name .text.zeno, and it doesn't care. It still runs fine. 
I can merge sections together if they're existing sections. So I can take the dot R data, which is read write data, and I can merge it with, or sorry, I can merge the dot data section, which is read only data, and merge it with the read write data. And now I've got strings that can be manipulated and stuff like that. But the compiler or linker will at least warn you. It'll say you're trying to merge two sections that don't have the same permissions. Are you sure you really want to do that? I said yes. Yes, I do. 